Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the idea of self-actualization. Maslow believed that in life, people are first motivated to fill their basic deficiency needs before moving on to higher level growth needs. In essence, we as human beings are driven to satisfy a hierarchy of needs. The classical five stages in the model are physiological needs, safety needs, belongingness and love needs, esteem needs, and finally, the pinnacle of human development, self-actualization. Maslow states that the first four stages are characterized by what he calls deficiency needs. That is, we satisfy these needs to help us avoid unpleasant feelings or consequences. This is in contrast to growth needs or being needs. This drive is present during the self-actualization stage of the model, and it states that the self-actualizing individual is motivated by something deep inside of them rather than being motivated by what other people think of them. In other words, they are intrinsically rather than extrinsically motivated. Some more examples of growth or being needs are the desires for wholeness, perfection, completion, aliveness, beauty, goodness, playfulness, and self-sufficiency. The first stage of the model is the individual's physiological needs. These are the most basic survival needs, such as food, water, warmth, rest, and shelter. If a human being is struggling to meet their physiological needs, then they are unlikely to be able to effectively pursue any of the other higher stages, such as safety, belongingness, esteem, and finally, self-actualization. Next are the safety needs. These encompass multiple different forms of safety, for example, physical safety from war, natural disasters, family violence, or childhood abuse. Also, there's economic safety, such as having job security or some form of savings. And finally, personal security, that is some form of human rights or some knowledge that they are not going to be exploited and have protection under the law. Next comes the need for belonging and love. This includes friendships, forms of intimacy and a good relationship with one's family. This sense of belonging can either be in large groups, such as in one's company, or even in just a small group, such as one's family or a small social club that they belong to. And this need is especially strong in childhood as they depend so much on their family and can also be heavily influenced by the need to fit into a particular group as they get older. Esteem needs come after this and there are two main subsections of this category. The lower version is characterized by one having a need to be respected by others. This can come in the form of status, recognition, fame, prestige or attention from others. However, the higher version is the need for self-respect as opposed to respect from others. Some examples would be the need and desire for self-confidence, independence, some form of mastery in the subject, or strength, either physical or emotional strength. Some state that there are actually two more stages between esteem needs and self-actualization. The first coming straight after esteem needs would be cognitive needs. This is a desire for knowledge, understanding of the world around them. These people are curious, inquisitive, and have a desire to solve problems. After the cognitive needs comes the aesthetic needs. These are characterized by a desire for some form of symmetry, order, and beauty. At this stage, we can see that we are beginning to get into the being or growth needs that we discussed earlier. For example, a desire for wholeness, aliveness, and beauty. And finally, we reach the stage of self-actualization. This can be defined as the realization of one's full potential. This includes all forms of potential, for example, creative potential, intellectual potential, social potential, and so on. Maslow writes that, what a man can be, he must be, this need we may call self-actualization. In other words, the need to become what one has the potential to be. This is the core purpose that one's life should be centered around, to fully realize their potential. We'll now go over a range of characteristics of self-actualized people in order to better understand how we can replicate them in our own life. Firstly, the self-actualized individual is accepting of themselves and others and their life circumstance. They are authentic and true to themselves and are able to accept both their strengths and their weaknesses. Next, they have a strong appreciation of life. Maslow writes that self-actualizing people have the wonderful capacity to appreciate again and again, freshly and naively, the basic goods of life with awe, pleasure, wonder, and even ecstasy, however stale these experiences may have become to others. Another important part of the self-actualized individual is that they have a core purpose, 
typically a mission that is beyond themselves and their egoistic desires. Moreover, they find pleasure and excitement in this hard work and they value the journey and process of mastery as much as the end goal. Because of their focus on the bigger picture and their main purpose in life, they are not troubled by the small things and don't get hung up over superficial or unnecessary things. Similarly, they are motivated by growth, exploration and a love of humanity. Like I said earlier about them being authentic, this means that they are true to themselves rather than how others want them to be. In other words, they are no longer dependent on esteem needs and deficiency needs in general. Maslow states that self-actualizers have become strong enough to be independent of the good opinion of other people or even their affection. The honours, the status, the rewards, the popularity, the prestige and the love they can bestow must have become less important than the self-development and inner growth. Also, they are independent and are comfortable with solitude. Following on from this, it is typical that they would much rather have a few intimate relationships rather than many superficial or shallow ones. However, their interpersonal relationships with all people are marked by a deep, meaningful and loving bond, and they are always very open to other people's opinions and ideas. They are still highly socially compassionate, very humanitarian and have good moral intuition. These all combine and the individual always aims to see the good in people and has a deep desire to help humanity. They also have a sense of humour and an ability to laugh at themselves. Along with their humanitarian nature, they are focused on resolving cultural problems rather than personal egoistic problems. Their goals centre around a desire for the betterment of society as a whole. They are also able to resist enculturation, that is, being passively moulded by their culture, their goals and values come from within themselves, rather than being determined by the cultural conventions around them. More characteristics include a tendency to be highly creative and a desire for them to be able to freely express this creativity in their career and their life in general. Furthermore, they are grateful, humble and always embrace the unknown. Maslow talks about the importance of humility in this passage. They are all quite well aware of how little they know in comparison with what could be known and what is known by others. Because of this, it is possible for them, without pose, to be honestly respectful and even humble before people who can teach them something. Next, self-actualizing individuals are commonly reported to have what is called peak experiences. Maslow's description summarizes these brilliantly. Peak experiences are feelings of limitless horizons opening up to the vision, the feeling of being simultaneously more powerful and also more helpless than one ever was before the feeling of ecstasy and wonder and awe, the loss of placement in time and space with, finally, the conviction that something extremely important and valuable had happened, so that the subject was to some extent transformed and strengthened even in his daily life by such experiences. A final few characteristics is that they live in the present, they are not ideological, they do not stereotype, they do not get caught up with trends and Finally, linking back to the idea of humility, self-actualized people do not think they are perfect. They are always aware of the great potential for growth that lies ahead of them. Now, before we look at some ways in which we can become self-actualized ourselves, we will look at some examples of self-actualized people from history in order to get a better idea of how some of these characteristics can be embodied in individuals. Albert Einstein, Henry David Thoreau, Albert Schweitzer, who had a mission beyond themselves, Mahatma Gandhi, who risked his life for the purpose of freedom. He also had a brilliant philosophy of life, summarised in the phrase, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Next, Viktor Frankl, the survivor of multiple Nazi concentration camps, who is a special example of someone who has gone beyond self actualization to the next, lesser known stage of self-transcendence. We'll come on to this in much more depth shortly. Some more examples are Nelson Mandela, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, Eleanor Roosevelt, Jane Addams, William James, Aldous Huxley, Baruch Spinoza, Eugene Debs, Friedrich Douglas, Edith Tarbell, Harriet Tubman, George Washington Carver, Walt Whitman, and finally Aristotle. His idea of eudaimonia, or the flourishing of human beings, links very strongly with ideas of self actualization Now we will look at some techniques for how one can become self actualized the most important, practical and effective step to transform your life and become self-actualized is to assess your life. 
Some of the questions we must ask ourselves to do this could be, where have I been? What has my past taught me about myself and my nature? Where am I now? What is the focus of my life today? And does this truly align with my core purpose? And also, where am I going? With the way that I'm living now, where will my life end up in the next five, 10, 20 years? Is this where I want to be? Or do I need to change the direction that my life is heading? Another powerful question that can be daunting yet very necessary to ask oneself is, am I living a life that I find deeply rewarding and meaningful? When assessing our lives, it's important for us to get to know our core strengths and drives. Some questions that may help with this could be, what do I truly find meaningful and fulfilling in life? What do I love doing? What do I want to be as a child? What could I do for 10 years without getting bored? All these questions can help us reveal our true passions and callings in life. Similarly, we must try and realise our dreams and goals. We need to create a purposeful and fulfilling vision for our life. One so powerful and resonating that it can bring you to tears just by reading it aloud. Another thing that may help us is to confront our fears. We need to familiarise ourselves with them, articulate them, understand them rather than just running away from them like we may have been used to doing. Shadow work is a closely related task. We won't go into depth in this in this video, but it would be very useful to check out my most recent video that is on the shadow and how one can effectively do shadow work in order to become their best self. Also, during this process of assessing our life, it is of utmost necessity that we try our best to see through our self-deceptions. We need to be radically honest while doing this work. We need to treat it like our very life depends on it because in reality, it, it does. Our life does depend on this work. Now, during this work, it is almost a certainty that you may become overcome by guilt and shame, but it's important not to be angry with yourself. We should accept any mistakes that we have made and we can now have that realization that now is the time to make a change for the better. Not tomorrow, not next week, not after that promotion. Now, all it takes is that change of attitude and one's journey to self-actualization begins. And we need to remember that this work of assessing one's life is not just a one-off thing that we do once on the train journey home. Instead, this is a continuous process that we must carry out regularly. We need to be constantly assessing our progress, our accomplishments and areas that still need improvement. Something that can help tremendously with this and is practically a must if you want to carry out this work is to keep a journal. This can be a physical journal or an online form of note taking. Um, I recommend Evernote. It's a very useful tool to effectively carry out this work. Another useful technique or attitude to practice is to take 100% responsibility for your life. Accept that it is you who needs to change, not your partner or your boss or society, it's you. This is your life, we need to toughen up and take responsibility. Do not project your problems onto others. It is you who are responsible for your life. You can deny it as much as you like, but this victim mentality will certainly prevent you from reaching your full potential and becoming self-actualized. Another useful thing to do is to learn how to stay in our center. In other words, we should learn to live in the present rather than regretting the past and worrying about the future. Although we can still think about the past and future, particularly when assessing our lives, we must realise that it is only now, in this present moment, when we can make progress towards our goals. We should not wallow in regret, but we should rather accept it and do our best in this very moment to do something about it. Another effect of living in the present is that life assumes a state of non-resistance, flow. Everything is alive, alert, active, and there is an inner calmness. This is similar to a state of deep work or flow that people experience when they are doing something they love. Meditation can help tremendously with living in the present. And the final way to achieve self-actualization is to try to embody the characteristics that we discussed earlier. However, when one aims to become self-actualized, there are many obstacles that can hinder their progress and even cause them to waste years of their life if they are not aware of some of these traps. Firstly, German psychiatrist Fritz Perls warns that one may confuse self-actualizing with self-image actualizing. People mistakenly actualize a self-concept rather than their true selves. Secondly, one may think that self-actualization has to do with reaching a high social status or becoming externally recognized as successful. 
And this is the only way to become truly self-actualized if one is highly famous and universally recognized. However, this is not true because this need for recognition is an aspect of the esteem section of the pyramid. It should no longer be one's main drive when they are trying to self-actualize. Finally, Maslow tells us that we should accept that there are regressive forces that exist in the psyche that inhibit growth. However, we should learn to view these symptoms not as a sign that we are ill and need medications, but rather as a cry from the growth forces within, warning us that a change in our life is needed. Towards the end of Maslow's life, he formulated a stage after self-actualization, a stage he called self-transcendence. Self-transcendence is characterized by an ability for one to realize the unity of all being and to have an intuitive understanding of the connectedness between all things. There is a shift in values from the self to something much greater, something beyond the self. These people take responsibility not only for themselves, but for the world and society at large. It comes with the realization that you are only a small part of a much greater whole, and so we must act accordingly. You only act in the way that promotes the well-being and functioning of the whole. Maslow states that transcendence refers to the very highest and most inclusive or holistic levels of human consciousness, behaving and relating as ends rather than means to oneself, to significant others, to human beings in general, to other species, to nature and to the cosmos. Another characteristic is that those in the stage of self-transcendence have frequent peak experiences and also something known as plateau experiences. Plateau experiences can be thought of as gentler, more sustained forms of serenity that can be cultivated through conscious, diligent effort. It is a cognitive blissfulness that arises when one transcends the ego's selfish needs and lives in a complete appreciation and love for the present moment. Again, meditation is very helpful technique to experience this state of mind. A couple more ways in which we can experience this state of mind is by experiencing the beauty of nature, for example, gazing at a flower intensely in a meditative state. This is a brilliant way in which one can experience the inherent and awe-inspiring beauty that exists in even the most simple things, those things that we typically overlook. Another method is when with a family member or a friend, imagining that you or he or she is going to die soon. This is a very effective technique at getting us to become present and truly becoming aware and appreciative of the other person. We can truly realize how much we love them. Some final phrases that summarize the idea of self-transcendence are, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do not ask what you can get from life, but ask what you can give. Holism, this is viewing everything as parts of a greater whole, all of which are in intimate interconnection. And spirituality, either theistic or non-theistic, and having the willingness to deny themselves in order to serve something greater than themselves. But how can one achieve this state of self-transcendence? Firstly, one can dedicate themselves to spirituality, meditation and mindfulness. The extreme end of the scale would be enlightenment and ego death both of which would be the ultimate form of self-transcendence, but it certainly doesn't have to be this extreme. It can just be a simple yet very consistent daily meditation and mindfulness habit. Some other things that can help are being creative and making sure that we construct our life purpose in such a way that we express our creativity freely without bearing it away. Also, we can get close to and come to find great inspiration in nature Next, we can engage in a process of shadow work. Again, I highly recommend watching my previous videos that covers shadow work in a lot more detail. It's perhaps one of the most effective things that one can do in order to improve all aspects of their lives. Next, it can help to live in a positive environment, one that is transcendence conductive to the individual. Finally, in order to reach this ultimate stage of Maslow's hierarchy, we must dedicate our life to something bigger, something greater, and something that goes beyond just ourselves. Thank you very much for watching, and be sure to like if you found the video useful, and be sure to subscribe because it really does help the channel out. I appreciate every single person that watches these videos, and I do hope you find the ideas as useful as I did when first learning about them. Thank you again and I'll see you next time on Feeling Philosophical and goodbye.